we'll get there now. So we're quiet and uh, introduce to you uh, Dimitri from Love Holidays. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me well? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good stuff. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about GitOps and running it in production. Uh, to kick it off, I would like to ask a question. Do you really, really know what is running in your production right now? Uh, I'm really running, not just what you assume it's there. Right now, I can tell you exactly what's in my production without actually accessing it. This is done thankfully to the GitOps. Would you ask me the same question a year back? I'd have to delete all my PMs, tear down the applications, build them from scratch, redeploy, and I'll be sure once deployed. But over time, my confidence will drift. I believe that all ways of the CI CD are the one to see the both the cloud like here, and I do encourage you to move on. Uh, I'm Dimitri Lerner, I'm looking after DevOps at a light travel <coughs> agency called Lopoldix. Uh, you are welcome to connect and ask questions on LinkedIn. I occasionally talk uh, about PGCP DevOps communities at deploy the live. I will be aiming to add some more GitOps information there as well, sure, after this session. I'm searched by the GCP communities maybe this. Just to cut straight and chase uh, what GitOps actually is, it's really important to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, fundamentally, it's a change away from push to pull in your continuous delivery pipelines. It's not very simple, but it's truly subtle. What the impact it has on the way you run things is profound. Imagine that in the past you have to tell your system what is there for them to run, so you have to deploy to your environments, communities, you tell. With GitOps, your environments ask you what is there for us to run, they check it up and they make sure it's running. Um, with GitOps, you store a declarative desired state of your environment in the source control. And it's the job to make sure that it continuously syncs it with your environments. Therefore, there is never a drift. Uh, <coughs> given this, making changes with the GitOps are as follows. You go to your repo, you commit a code change, you wait a couple of minutes, and it's eventually consistent, so your change gets propagated. If somebody comes in and deletes stuff from your environment, GitOps will take care of that. So unless it's in the source code, it's not going to be into a And if it's deleted from the environment, it's going to be still brought back to the state that is described uh, inside the source control. Don't take my word for it, the Kelsey Hype Tower thinks it's awesome, so we can always trust this dude. I also have to confess, uh, this entire presentation is a giant lie. And the lies hidden in the title. I say that it's one year of GitOps in production, and I was meant to do this talk in September. So, what you're going to see is an early preview of 10 months with GitOps in production. The rest of the presentation is going to be a lot more factual. <coughs> um, who is running Jenkins here? Okay, that's a good path. And um, who is running Kubernetes in production? So the same path. Is it the same people? Those who are running the collection, raise their hands. Okay, no, that's actually two separate paths. Uh, and I've already seen a few hands for the GitOps, so there have been about five hands raising up earlier. So who's running GitOps in collection? Okay, that's unfair because you won't me. Uh, very last question. Who does really know what's running your production right now? Who really know? Who's confident? Good man. Okay. Good man. <laughs> Let's move on. So, I believe it's important to give a bit of backstory. How did we decide to go to GitOps and what brought us there? We had a fairly standard setup. We've been running physical servers on a uh, collocation environment. We've been hosting KVM VMs. Uh, we run Jenkins. 
singular blockchain has to grow evolve to follow our continuous integration of delivery needs in a complete monster. And lastly, it was using Ansible and some few control to perform deployments into our environment. If you look at what was made in our continuous integration, it's very simple. To me as a developer, committing the code to the Git, Jenkins is following the free form, gets the changes, builds up and produces archetype in the repository. But this was only true for the main branches. It's not because I can't automate the feature branches, it's because we didn't have enough servers to run as many fields as our developers delivered. Therefore, I had to put the tabs on their both cognitive load, or they need to decide whether the commit they've just pushed needs to be built or not. Not a great place to be, I absolutely hated that. Continues uh, delivery bit. Jenkins also named as a CI ops, everything is driven from your CI tool. It's also super simple. You have developer going to Jenkins, spend about five minutes to find the right tab, job, a version number to deploy, press the button, and then your Ansible or Cube Control takes care of pushing it out to your Kubernetes cluster or maybe VM, whichever you run it. It actually doesn't sound too bad, so why would you move? So we've been, like, I personally run that monster of Jenkins for two years and have quite a lot of insight. So the next four slides are jam packed with information to pay 100% attention. One, actually, I like it isn't jam packed with information. I'll try to get it to this time. What we have with Jenkins can be described as a snowflake box because if you are an external observer to our CI CD platform a year ago and you watch us use it for a day, you'll think our singular goal was to increase entry to make sure nothing is the same in randomness. Just try it. We are all pipelines, build jobs, uh, <coughs> nothing is alike. Even UI is not consistent because there it uses the blue ocean, there it uses Ruby pipelines, there it uses the old promotion plugin, like that. So now, that's going to be four important slides. Number one. Number two. Number three. And number four. I thought it was surprising that I wanted to move away, right? That's <laughs> the one monster to just rule the world. Uh, I actually have a real insight out of this. Do not do free fall plugin installs in your games. You'll regret it. That's just a nightmare. And we only had one physical machine to do the fields, at least to manage the Jenkins master. So any upgrades for your plugins or any upgrades for your uh, security patches of the Jenkins itself is a nightmare. We have to make it up, we have to do it out of virus, and we always find ethical pressure at the same time. But it's not all that gloomy, so uh, about a year ago, we finally proved the case that we as a company need to move to the cloud and GCP was a cloud of choice to go. So what we have to do now is to make sure that we do not repeat mistakes in the past the cloud in Europe. Uh, we set ourselves a bunch of goals to make sure that things are cleaner and neater now. Uh, first of all, I wanted to have a full audit trail for my CI CD. Especially the same business. Uh, in the past, with the Jenkins, you have to open Jenkins, find the tab, find the pipeline, find the job, find the particular field, and then put it next to a hash and a name to know what has happened. Deployment was some time ago. Jenkins down, well, your trouble. Jenkins disappeared, your trouble. So there is no easy way for me to tell what happened. So all I have is a database, and Git is an excellent database. I want to have everything as a pair of this simple stuff. I want my continuous integration and my continuous uh, delivery deployment scripts to be source control first for the reproducible build from scratch in any new place I want to have them. I don't want to put any restrictions on my developers. They, don't, they should not really think about whether this commit is one to build or next one is a better. I want to build every single commit. And I also want to remove limitations for the deployment in the physical environment to perform a deployment. It's always the trade-off against your capacity. You have to take a part of capacity out 
update the versions and look at that again. If you are trying to do two deployments at the same time against the same service, you're likely to take it down or you need to build a really good advanced mechanisms. Until we build those, we have a lot of problems. So I just would like to take this thinking completely away from the picture of my developers and the rest of their the deployments. They should be able to deploy <coughs> when the feature is ready. I don't want to have any configurational drift, so I want to ensure that whatever I have set as a desired state within my repo, it's exactly what's in my environment, not nothing else. And lastly, um, <coughs> the job of continuous integration is to produce deployable artifacts. The job of continuous delivery is to make sure they're running in the environment. And for a really long time, it's been okay to, to allow your continuous delivery to have unrestricted access to a lot of environments for performance action. It's only one way to achieve it, but it's definitely not the best. I would like to take this power away from my continuous delivery. So, given all those goals, and I'm thinking about what GitOps can provide you with, that's a perfect fit. It just uh, gives you all the requirements of your type of stuff for myself for our block and maturity. If you think that GitOps is that scary tool that you don't want to add to your stack and you already have gazillion tools and they push it even more new, think differently. If I had only five minutes to implement GitOps, I'll do something like that. I have a forever running file while loop that pulls from my source code and applies that to a cluster that's GitOps. I do not recommend running this one. <laughs> well, if you're very attention, maybe. <laughs> so instead, we went with a slightly bit better tool. Uh, we forced the guys who originally coined the term GitOps, created a tool called Cloud. They did a lot of good stuff around open source, so I had no reason not to trust the solution and give it a go. We tried it. Works pretty well. Uh, once we decided what is our CI and CD going to be, we had to define the CI. And luckily for us, end of July last year, Google had rebranded Container Builder as a Google Cloud Build. It's a very minimalistic uh, CI CD platform, which is super well and tightly integrated with the GitHub. So it's a couple of clicks and your repo is linked into the Google Cloud Build. Uh, minimalistic side also comes to the way how you define the build steps. Each build step is a Docker image, and they give you a bunch of them, like M, Gradle, Maven, NPM, uh, G Cloud, and a few others to do the whole standard stuff. But if you'd like to extend that, you can always write your own Docker image and use that as part of the build, or you can use community build. Uh, it has no real limitation of any parallel builds you can do. There are about 10 different projects, but if you have multiple projects, the limit becomes so high that for nothing but the biggest organization, it's not much of a problem. Or maybe a really, really slow build. And lastly, it's declarative and it's code uh, source code first. That's how it looks like. Uh, here you have a build that does Java Gradle build. Does a bunch of stuff using a great image. And then we're running a custom step, a custom builder that we wrote called GitOps. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. And then this is just going to produce an image of uh, your best app and start in our registry. Each repo in application has the copy of a very similar stuff to perform the build steps and all the rest of those applications. <coughs> so I'm no longer managing it's very slow to do. It's just a small little snippets of declarative build pipelines scattered around application repositories. So, in theory, uh, continuous integration with a Google Cloud build is no different, except that you swap the word changes for the Google Cloud build, and now you do it for every single commit, whether it's a feature branch or whether it's a master branch. In practice, it is slightly different, and we added a custom step called GitOps. So once you build artifact, test it, and build the code, test it, and create an artifact, 
we're running the very last step of the Git ops, which talks with the flux Git repo. So a little bit more of that. Unfortunately, it's not an open source chill step. But I'm giving you a recipe and you can cook it yourself very easily. Getting treat is obviously Git. Next to is a hub, which is a GitHub, a high level CLI tool that allows you to create PRs, to do reviews, and also use YQ, which is JQ, equivalent of YAML. Using Git, you check it out the uh, GitHub repo, you create a new branch, you updating the version of the image you just built, which was your best model. With a new version of V2, you commit those changes, you push it into the branch, and using how you create the PR. There are very tiny URLs here at the bottom of that I'll try to share the exact release so you can find those very easily. That's pretty simple. So now when we go into the cloud, uh, to the continuous delivery aspect of it, I'm a developer. And now I have a PR being automatically created by my build. I look at this PR, I review, I approve it, and then merge it in. At that very time, V2 of my best app is being merged into the main branch of my Flux Git repo. And what I have is an application running on my cluster called Flux GitOps. It continuously pulls my Git repo for any changes. It finds that I push the V2 version of the app. And it makes sure that the cluster is in sync with whatever is in my source control. Because source control is a source of truth that you <laughs> the single or aim of Flux to make sure that your cluster looks exactly as described in your Git repo. So going back to the benefits, they're huge, but there could be skeptics in the room that need a bit more convincing. So GitHub gives you best practices. Like really, really strict teacher, it cannot disallow you to be silly. You can still mess up stuff. I can have few control and apply that into my production. But what GitHub does, it lets me do, it lets me do, and it changes it back to actually what it meant to be. Take so this as a source code and apply it to change back to production. Next thing I do, I do cube control edit on my production config map, get up so that we do it, and two minutes later it's fixed back to what's defined in source control. Even if you're more stubborn person, now it takes a few tries to start doing that, and you know the way you change things is to go to the repo and update it there. And it's also such a natural way for developers to perform deployments. You don't look up for a new tool, you just change the code. And hence I believe it's super developer friendly. These days, uh, when there is something just the community when you're pushing a new tool, some developers saying that this next tool is going to solve all your problems. And they want to keep increasing that tool stack, so you're going to be the best developer out there. I think, that, uh, I think there are way too many tools already, and we should focus on those that work. And by using GitOps, you can do a huge favor to developers by removing the continuous delivery application from the stack. Now we just have GitHub, GitLab, or Bitbucket to perform the changes, which is a lot more natural. <coughs> um, lastly, I don't think it's going to be like it, so I want to make sure so I want to give it a go and be over the skeptical. But for those who are skeptical, let me tell you a story. On cold, sunny, winter day of December 28, it was about. Well, I've been working my favorite tool, GitOps to by Flux. And I was updating the configuration for the stage. That was done really well. And that also shows how much we love GitOps. We love GitOps so much that we managed to use GitOps. So it's a bit of inception there. And I made my change and I applied it and I cut the corner. I did the same thing that I should not be doing. I did cube control apply it. And that in itself would be okay because I was a source control issue. There was a slight tiny tiny issue with this. I was not connected to my staging cluster, I was connected to my production cluster instead. So what happens when you apply staging GitHub configuration to a production cluster? And it is you've just created a monster. You created a self-replicating mechanism that has one purpose in life. 
to make sure that your production environment looks exactly as you want it to stage it. Not the best thing to do. And where you have a lot of integration drift and suffering as well. So initially I thought this some fun fucking group developer of mine the stage integration from and I was trying to figure out who and that was me. I should have thought mm. of um, I've applied product production change to the VTOPS once I realized the mistake and it became a good citizen again and it's more truly hard to make sure that my production work exactly as I want to compare my Git environment. So well then it was about 18 minutes of the great state. But much more painfully personally is I have to pay a tribute to our dad's white sugar about her with those elements, which is a fair price for a mess up like that. Another issue that you might experience with uh, Flux and GitOps is from the YAML packets. If you do stuff that is just impossible for YAML to comprehend, you're going to break it. And that's the same with view control apply or if you're using the CI tool that money tries to push your stuff into the cluster, that stuff all, all gonna break if you're doing the wrong YAML manifest. But there is a slight difference with the GitOps when you're using Flux. It's gonna get upset, but it's gonna just complain about it in the logs. So unless you monitor the logs, you will never know that it's broken. So just be aware that you might break your changes. So we at LaFolle is really love GitOps and it works super well for the last 10 months. In fact, we performed 11,190 deployments since September, which is not a significant number and I'd like to do a lot more of it. They actually have a lot of It should be. I think they also you can perform, you can deploy multiple commits per deployment and changing one image, so it probably doesn't match the number of commits because it's higher. Um, even more interesting, uh, me as a person who works in my clusters and my environments all the time, I spend most of my day doing something and tweaking things around, <coughs> I find myself using GitHub a lot more than I use to control because GitHub is just more, more natural to comprehend a large set of information about my running system. And I trust GitHub so much that I longer need to use Git Control, which to me is something I didn't even believe just a year ago when they give up Git Control. Now it's still so out there. Not even. But it's only beginning of journey and there are a few things to do. So what we're considering doing going forward is to embrace continuous deployment and carry deployments for that at least here. So it's coming. Uh, the WeWorks guys have actually got a tool for managing GitHub's uh, Canary deployments. It's called Flagger. I haven't tried it yet, but I think it's worth mentioning. They also got yet another tool. I'm really not sponsored by them. Uh, called Kubiv. And the purpose of this tool is to let you know what is different between your source code and your running cluster. If you take this knowledge, and you do cube control delete. You have an ultimate system that removes all the garbage or all bad developers' code from your cluster. So it's something we'd like to try. So if you like what we talked about and you would like to give GitOps a try, here is the URL. It's fairly simple. And there are some articles that we've worked about uh, how we've been running it. But it's not the only implementation of GitOps. Another two notable entrants are RSV and Razy. Razy is open source by IBM. <coughs> Haven't tried them, but you're welcome to go if you did try them. You know. If you enjoyed Kubernetes, GitOps, and would like to help me out to build my platform that will follow this, we're hiring. Any questions? Time for a couple of questions. Anyone want to shout one out? Yep, go ahead. I just want to ask how do you identify the, the environments that you have? I mean, you say that you, you were connected on the wrong environment. Is the environment, is there a knowledge in the environment that, oh, I am the production one? So you can double check. Yes, so you're on the The question is, is there a knowledge by environment what environment it is? And the answer is yes. Why deploy the flux to environments? 
you tell it what it is. Therefore, you can monitor multiple repos, you can monitor multiple branches, you can even have multiple fluxes running on the same cluster because you may want to separate application stack from the same system tooling and that to be joined on a cluster from the two different directions. Okay, any other questions for Dimitri? Hi. I was wondering about the CICD pipeline. Why do you automate the functional test, if any? Especially the kinds of that before you build the more like the test. Yep. Uh, it's going in the shameful direction. We're still, we're still using Jenkins. And the job of this Jenkins is actually pretty cool. We have a development project which allows us to create 50 or 60 replicas of production sliced around. And we're running that test against that. So we have a mechanism where we can cherry pick versions to deploy and then fall back on the latest version of the rest of the performance and run tests. And developer is following for testing against that. So that works for really well. Okay, um, thank you very much, Dimitri. Yeah. Uh, the next was, oh, I mean, yeah, one more question. Then. <coughs> How do you uh, uh, get risk of security vulnerabilities that you think is possible? I actually should follow up with uh, true cluster in all the sense. Okay, let's go to say, what do you so it's a question of completely outside of what we do, right? So just an external question. Do you all WSP testing? I mean, that's the best answer. That's the GitHub is not different. It suffers as a point. So um, yeah, Dimitri had to do that talk without his speaking. I know we spent a few minutes battling around trying to get it to work. Um, I know it's a, it's a pretty horrible feeling. It's like you've got a parachute jumping out of an airplane doing that. So I think an extra special big hand for Dimitri to speak.